Father, we thank you and we bless you, God of heaven. We give you praise, glory, and honor. What an exciting time we're having in your holy presence, Father God. Thank you for the service so far. Oh God, the worship, the praise, the prayers, the testimonies. My God, I'm making the prophetic declarations that we've had so far. God, I bless you that your word is not my word, not our word, shall not fall to the ground. Every word we've spoken, every utterance by faith, you shall bring to pass in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you more so now at this hour. As you come, Father God, to hear your word. Lord, our hearts are prepared to receive your word. Our ears are open to hear you. So speak for your servants are listening. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen and amen. A very good afternoon now to everybody. Thank you for those of us who are here with us online and those who will be joining us on Facebook, YouTube later to, to, to watch and receive from the recording of this message. Wherever you are, whatever time zone, whatever culture, whatever continent, we speak God's blessing to you and to your house in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Kingdom Gospel Church, where the Lord lives. Amen. Where the Lord lives. Amen. The city of the Lord. Hallelujah. That's where he lives with us. Amen. Or rather, we live with him. Amen. So welcome to the kingdom of God, the city of the Lord, where our walls are salvation and our gates praise. Everything we do is God-centric, kingdom-centric, and Christ-centric, led by the Holy Spirit. So please feel free to receive and to enjoy the Lord this morning, even in his presence as we come into the word of God. By the grace of God, I want to continue teaching we began last Sunday on the right pursuit. I could not even get into my nose last Sunday. I'm sure you can tell because the Holy Spirit took over and he just spoke from his heart to us. Amen. 40 or so minutes, the Lord spoke about getting the pursuit right because you and I only have this one chance. It is appointed to man, for man to die once. We have this one chance in life. There is no reincarnation like some people believe. We all have this one time. We have this each of us will have this race that is set before us. So let's spend our energies and our strength and our powers and our talents and abilities on the right pursuit. Any pursuit that is not God-centric, any pursuit that will not lead to eternity, any pursuit that will not take it eternity with the Lord is not the right pursuit. I'll come to that in a minute. What is pursuit? Pursuit is whatever it is that is occupying your time, your life, your graces, your anointing, and everything that you are and that you have. What are you pursuing in life? What is your ambition? And what are your aspirations? If it is outside of God, my friend, let me advise you, go back to the drawing table. Amen. Even God says to us not to invest so much on this earth, but to invest in heaven. Lay up your, your treasures in heaven. Where there is no moth or rust. Where there's no rust, there's no rust, there's no moth, no moth does not destroy. And so we must come to understand the people of God that our life is not just what it is now. There's another dimension, another realm that God expects us, amen, to match what we do here, if not even do better. Father, we thank you. What are your pursuits? What are my pursuits? No matter the number of pursuits, maybe a thousand, maybe ten, ten, maybe a hundred, maybe fifty, maybe one or two, everything must come together. Everything must come together, amen, led by God, directed by God, according to his will. And his plan is proposed for your life. So the right pursuit, what are we talking about when we say right pursuit? And because people are pursuing all kinds of things. There are some this morning who are pursuing women. <laughs> of course, there are some who are pursuing men this morning. There are some who are pursuing money. There are some who are pursuing all kinds of things. What I'm simply saying is the man you are pursuing or the woman you are pursuing, the child you are pursuing, whatever you are pursuing, make sure it is God-led, God-centered, Christ-centric. And of course, Powered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. As a child of God, as a believer. So this message, people of God, is about realigning our pursuit accordingly so that it will be in the line with the will of God for our lives. Amen. Many have a will, but are walking outside of the will. For as long as God has given you a talent and a diamond and a blessing, you will make money, you will live well. But is that the will of God for you? Amen. I, I love the way Matthew in chapter 16 puts it. What shall he profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? All of the infrastructure, the systems, all of the money, all of the architecture, everything in this whole world does not equate to the soul of one person. So there's nothing in this world or in this life 
that should be able to take us out of the will of God. Because it is not this life now that determines you. It is eternity that determines you. What shall a man, what shall a, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing. What shall a property man if he, if he gains the whole world? Yes, you a lot of by yourself, you own the world. What shall <laughs> profit a man and but loses his soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And so we must, we must, we must, people of God understand that God wants us to 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 live right and to work right and to do life right. In other words, the right pursuit of life. I mean, so many people, this one I can assure you are dissipated, tired. Went to bed tired, woke up tired. Expending energy, expending strength, power, talking almost through the night in their dreams, they talk. Well, they are pursuing all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, like Job said, naked we came and naked we shall go back. What is your pursuit? What are your pursuits? What is my pursuit? What are my pursuits? No pursuit is worth it if you take us away from God. Or the life God has ordained for us. The blessing of God and indeed his plan, his assignment, his purpose or destiny is in the place of his will for us. And it's our responsibility to find out God's will and begin to pursue it. And I pray that this word today, part number two of the right pursuit, will help us in that direction in Jesus' name. Our text is Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 to 33. Matthew 6, 24 to 33. I normally read from the New King this version of the Holy Bible. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm not political. I won't say it's the best or it's not the best. That's my preferred version. You read from other versions. The message is the same. God is God. Christ is Christ. His Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's go into the Bible. Amen. Matthew 6, 24 to 33. In Matthew 6, 24, you read this in your Bibles. It says this to, to all of us. No one can serve two masters. For, he, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. So your will cannot be from God and another will from mammon. It is impossible. As a matter of fact, to be honest, to, to, to do the will of God is a whole lifetime. It is not six years of marriage or 12 years of marriage or three years of education. It's your whole lifetime you are fulfilling the will of God. From even before you were born, God said the will. I want you to lift up Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has prepared beforehand that you and I should come and walk in it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. So it is not now you became doctor. It is not now you became an architect or, 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 or a marketer or a banker or a pastor. It was already prepared beforehand before you were even conceived in your mother's womb. Our responsibility is to discover Amen? In Christ. And then to follow his will. So no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Oh, I'm not serving mammon, but I have dreams. Yes, you cannot serve your own dreams as of God. Every dream must be birthed by God in Christ, in you, by the Holy Spirit. God is not against you having money or buying, going on holiday or building big houses. It's, 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 it's God's concern is that after you've done all this, where will, will you end? After I have done all this, where will I end? Amen. Oh, come on, people of God. I'd rather make heaven. Amen. <laughs> than anything else. Remember, what shall a man give a lesson for his soul? You cannot serve God and man. Therefore, I say to you, the Bible reads, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink. Or not about your body. What you will put on. It's not life more than food and body more than clothing. Look at the best of the air. For they neither so nor, nor, nor reap nor gather into bands. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more valued than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Not one. You don't believe one as that is. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the list of the field, how they grow, and, and they neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed or dressed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which there is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? 
Oh, you of little faith. I'll come to that in a minute. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Are you a Gentile? Am I? No, we are not. We are in Christ. We are still blood bought, blood washed. Amen. Redeemed of the Lord. Heavenly bound. Heaven bound, should I say. For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. That is their pursuit. Oh, God help us. If we now begin to pursue the way they pursue. We are supposed to be the light. <laughs> Amen. And the salt. The standard of God to the whole earth. And to the whole world. Well, what do we find ourselves sometimes doing exactly the same thing. That we are uh, alongside the same people. That we are supposed to be salt and light too. Therefore do not worry verse 31. What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Mm. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. <laughs> but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Which means God has food. God has clothes. God has every manner of comfort that we are, that we are, that we are asking for. It is what we need, not what we are want and then we pursue. Let me back up, people of God. And so we see here three kinds of pursuit. Oh my goodness. Do not worry about your life. And so some people think that life is all about food and drink and the body. Because on this side of heaven, on this side of heaven, man must eat, must eat. You know, clothes. You don't want to walk about and be naked. Amen. Your children, school uniform, clothes after school and everything. Yourself, all of us, you know, look nice. You know, life, good quality of life. Is that what this is all about? And the answer is no. Your life is much more than the clothes, the food, the drink, the house, the big car, and everything else. Or the career for that matter, or the business for that matter, or the ministry for that matter. Even those of us in in the in the, in, the, in the forefront of ministry. Your life is much, in fact, it is because God saved you that he trusted you to do, to do the, the work of the ministry. He wouldn't trust a Gentile, an unsaved man or woman, to come and pastor a church. In fact, it even being a pastor, a minister, a leader in the house of God, it's not, no, 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 no. I'm a pastor, so no, 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 no. It's about your relationship with God. That is the determining factor that makes God call us into his work or give open doors for us to be in the certain in the professions or occupations that he allows us to go into. If there was no relationship, how can God trust you? Would you? The answer is no. And so what we see, people of God, is that Jesus is speaking to disciples, us. This is to us. It's not for the Gentiles. He's talking about a matter of faith. Oh, you have little faith. That is not about Gentiles. Gentiles have no faith. It's about us. He's talking to church people, his disciples, those who should know him, but are acting as if they don't know him because they are doing the same things that Gentiles do, seeking after the food and the drink and the clothes, thinking that is all about life. And if you look at it, there's the one word that describes the blessing of God. The one phrase, if you will. Many are seeking after the blessing, not the blesser. Many are, in fact, even from the days of the of Israel in the wilderness, they wanted to see his acts. But he showed his ways to Moses. There's a difference. Amen. Church, why would he say, Oh, you have little faith? The audience he was talking to and still talking to today is us who should have faith in Almighty God. That with our God, nothing is impossible. But sadly and painfully, some of us are acting as if we are Gentiles. And so it says to us, these are the things the Gentiles seek after. It is not for you. Our focus is to seek God, his kingdom, his will, his agenda. And all of these things that the Gentiles are pursuing will be added to us. Church, that is the right pursuit. Where God leads in all that we do. Where God is number one. Where he's full, he's, in fact, Jesus taught us how to pray. Matthew 6, Luke 11. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
the first five sentences of that prayer framework is all about God and his kingdom and his will, his agenda. Our Father, that's the relationship who is in heaven. Okay? Hallowed be your name. That's worship. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. These are the things that in God's heart that he's sharing with us by his Holy Spirit. And so when the Lord was teaching us to pray, this is what you pray about. Oh, well, you will pray about yourself. Give us the day, our daily bread, and all of that. But put God first. Amen. Put the relationship first. Our Father who is in heaven. I've heard some people pray and worship and all that. They had to call him Father. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Our Father is how the Lord began. Teaching us how to pray. It's that relationship number one. And many are desiring all kinds of relationships, but, but their relationship with, with the Lord is, 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 is fractured. Amen. Not be totally broken, but it's not, it's not strong, it's not powerful as it should be. Amen. There should be no day I don't spend some time, even if it's five minutes, with your God and your King and your Father. How can you have a child in the same house? You don't even see them in the whole day. Sometimes in the whole week, they don't talk to you. Oh, well, they're in your house. You feed them, you clothe them. We are in the kingdom. He feeds us, he clothes us, he does all these things for us. And yes, some of us don't even have five minutes for him in the home, 24 hours in the day. Oh, Jehovah, our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, the worship. Sometimes we call him Father, let, let alone worship. And then what's it? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Before give me this day my daily bread. And I, I pray that the Lord will align our, realign our focus. Amen. That we shall put things right as it ought to be. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Then give me this day my food, my drink, and my clothes. Before we start talking about ourselves, we have to put him first. But I'm sure you will agree that when we pray, Hallelujah. Father, <laughs> uh, uh, come on, do I need to say the obvious? I don't need to repeat the obvious. And so we come back to this text again where he says to us, Oh, you have little faith. He's talking to his people. It's about, do we really trust God? Amen. Do we really trust him? As we should? Come on. Let's be, I cannot speak for you. I can I cannot speak for myself. I cannot even speak for my wife or my children because each of us stand by himself or herself alone with God. I am not in the relationship my wife shares with God because it's one-to-one. -one. Every knee shall bow before him and every tongue shall confess. So each and every one of us will be accountable for our lives before him. So how is your faith work with God? How is your faith? The Bible says, examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Oh my goodness, I couldn't examine you. Man looks on the outside. Only God looks on the inside to see what is in your heart. How close is your heart to him or how far is your heart from him? God is not just about bless me and bless me and bless me. It's about his will. It's about his agenda, his kingdom, and what he wants done on this earth. The Gentiles won't do it. He's looking to his church, his people. Does that explain perhaps, perhaps, why the Lord has not come back? Because we are not where he expects us to be. We've not taken the territory he wants us to take. Does that explain why the Lord has not come back for us? I don't know. And then it says, after all these things the Gentiles seek, may we not live like Gentiles in Jesus' name. May we not do life like the Gentiles in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. May our lives be, amen, as God always intended for, for, for us to, to live it in Jesus. So from our text for the people of God, where it is a story of two masters, amen. Let me put it this way. The Bible says it's mammon. Really, the, the, the service to mammon is our service, what we want to do, not what he wills for us to do. So it's a story of two masters. The question is, which master are you? Which master am I? Which master are we serving? Mammon or God? Or God and mammon? Amen. And so if I'm going to, if I'm going to, if I'm going to come into the right pursuit, we must know which master is detecting the things we are pursuing. So, do I need to remind you of the rich fool? Do I need to remind you? I mean, you know the story, you know the text. What about the rich young ruler in March chapter number 19? The rich ruler in Luke chapter number 12. 
Don't you remember? Probably look at one of them later, people of God. But the point I'm making, which master, which master are we serving? Oh, you may be the master of your manor. You may be the king of your castle, but you are under a master. Amen. Oh, 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 oh. What, what, what drives us? The passion, the tenacity, the relentlessness, the, the, the zeal. Uh, what is what 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 is what is what is driving us? What is making us to go and to and to and to plan and to and to scheme and to and to develop uh, all kinds of systems to make us achieve and organize and everything that we want to do? What 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 is the force or the power? Is it God? Is it Mammon? Hallelujah! Thank you, Jehovah. God will bless you. Romans six. Verse 15 to 23 is a story of two masters. Which one are we obeying? And in every area of life is a story of two masters. In fact, there's you. You are two-sided. There's the old you and the new you. Amen. 24 hours of the day, there's the dark and then the day. Amen. There's always two-sided. There's the negative and the positive. There's the man and the woman. There's never in between. Like he's saying, those who do statistics or, or mathematics or, or computer science, he says binary. So that's zero or one. The point is, which which side are you leaning to? It's the story of two masters. Many right now are planning all kinds of things. And may you wonder, what's the power behind this? What is the drive behind this? Listen, people of God. He's asking us, make sure your pursuit is right. Make sure your, your pursuit is right. I pray we will all hear the heart of the Lord and follow according. In Matthew, sorry, in Romans chapter 6, verse number 15 to 23, it's a bit of a long report, it's worth reading. Again, we are told, who do we obey? Who are we slaves to? Amen. Who? Or oh, what should I say? In Matthew 6, verse number 15, not Matthew, Romans, I beg your pardon, chapter 6, verse 15. What then? The Paul wrote to the church in Rome. Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly no. Listen. Two key words jump out. Law versus grace. Always two options. God and opposite God. Sit on the devil. Light, darkness. Amen. Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Is either the law or which one are you under? Which one are you pursuing? The law or the grace? Certainly, love implies in verse 16. Certainly, love, sorry, in same verse 15. Do you not know that to whom you present your, yourself slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey. Leading of leading, whether it's of, of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. There you go. Two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. Verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey. Whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was which to, of, uh, uh, to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness in the past, that is, and of lawlessness in the past that is linked to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Verse 20. Verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard of righteousness. What food did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been separate from sin and having become slaves of God, you have the fruit of to, to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Romans 6, 3, he sums it up so nicely. God and mammon, every pursuit is, is, listen, people of God, that is outside of God, does not lead to life. But when you are serving God, oh yes, what they are pursuing in mammon land will be added to you. So you never lose, you never lose, you never lose. It's always a win-win for the child of God. Church, I hope we hear God and pray we hear God. 
that God is calling us to the right pursuit. For when you were slaves, verse 20 says, of sin, you were free in regard to, to righteousness. So true. What food did you have then in this of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. There's this a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is what? Destruction. Proverbs tells us. But having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you now have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. That is, uh, should be our pursuit. Amen. Having begun the race, why are some of us changing the direction or pursuit? Amen. It's amazing how, how the Lord speaks and shows us things. I mean, I, I dare not say some of the things that He's shown me, even in the course of this study and preparing for this. Examples of people, you know, that, you know, it, come on, we're in the house of the Lord. You know, rooted and grounded, so we thought. And then a blessing, a promotion. Hello, church. Amen. Or marry the husband, or marry the wife, or had a baby, or, or change location from one country to another. And then the pursuits completely change. Your, your service to God is not bound by geography. Hello, church. Your service, I used to think many years ago, you know. If when you leave this country, that's it. No, 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 no. It is not because it is not geographic. It is not country. It is not the continent. It is the covenant of God. And the covenant works anywhere you are as a child of God. You may be in war from Syria, but covenant with the covenant of God will still work for you. You may, you may be in, in, in famine and drought region somewhere in Africa or Asia. The covenant of God will still work. When there was famine in the land, Isaac, we are told, <laughs> became prosperous, began to be prosperous, and became so prosperous. In fact, at that point, I think we could have changed him to prosperity. He, be he started becoming prosperous, he continued to be prosperous, and became very prosperous. Three times is written, I believe it's in Genesis chapter number 26. Church, let me remind us it's about the right pursuit. Every pursuit that is not right or wrong in the eyes of God leads to nothing but damage and destruction. It's a story of two masters. Who is detecting your pursuit? Which of the masters? No one can serve two masters. Jesus speaking says to us, oh, you have little faith. These are the things that the Gentiles seek after. And so the master that you and I submit to, serve, will determine our pursuit. I, rem I remember I've said it already. God has already set his plan and his will for us. It is not now. Now for us is when we discover this is what he, want, he wants me to do. And then you, you, you fall headlong into that pursuit. Everything has, there's nothing new. There's nothing God is doing new. Everything has been set. We are walking and living the drama of life that God has already concluded in, in eternity. So nothing takes God by surprise. It's already been concluded. For us it's new. It is not new. Amen. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God never planned for us to follow or pursue any bad route or bad lane or run a bad race. Everything in God is good and good and good. But we come into this race, we come into this life, and because of culture and influences from other people outside of God, they turn what's supposed to be good into something else that is not what God meant for it to be. I pray today that as we hear the voice of God, that we will have a desire to, to, to find out and to stay with what God has ordained for us in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen? Uh, the Bible talks about these three distinct pursuits of man. What you will eat, what we will eat, what you will wear, what I will wear, what you will drink and what I will drink. These are, are mammon-based and mammon led mammon driven pursuits and these are the wrong pursuits for a destiny carrying born again child of God to be consumed with what this life has to offer amen that our pursuit day and night 24 7, 365 going to bed tired waking up tired waking up early not for God for how to make the next move or the next step so that these pursuits that is mammon led and mammon driven will be achieved by yourself 
Well, that is not us born again children of God in Jesus' name. May we learn what God, what the Lord is saying here. Remember, this is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. Three over three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The Lord is speaking about God and the kingdom and the expectation of God. We are not supposed to, we were once Gentiles. Now we are saved, born again, blood bought, blood washed, redeemed, sealed by the Holy Spirit for eternity. How can we then go back and pursue the things dictated by, by, by man or by mammon or by this life? So what should be the, the right pursuit for the child of God? Amen. Very simple. Very, very simple for me to answer you. <laughs> what, so what should be the right pursuit for the child of God that has a destiny to fulfill? And how do we make the right pursuit? How do we? Let me take you to, um, to two quick scripture verses. Philippians chapter 1, 21. Amen. And then Galatians 2, verse number 20. And I believe God to help us to, today we'll, we'll, to close it. Only two parts, but if it allows us to move it to the next week, we'll move it again. Amen. Let's, let, 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 let's honor him as the way, the way he wants to speak to us. In Philippians 1, verse 20, 21, Paul writes, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So then how can we find pursuit here? Oh, Galatians 2 verse, 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is how we develop the right pursuit. We know the right pursuit. It must be Christ-centric. You must be doing that business for Christ. Oh, you are not carrying the money I gave into church. The money comes to your bank account. You end, Of course, but it must be Christ-centered. Amen. Your work as an employer, as an employee, as an employer, whether you are a manager, a floor shop, a floor shop assistant, whether you are the architect or the associate architect, whether you are the barrister or the lawyer or anybody in, 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 in the chambers, you know, wh whether you are the pastor or the, or, or the usher at the door, listen, everything we do, must be done for the glory of Christ the Lord. It's the life we live now is for him. So every pursuit must be driven by him. Remember Romans. Whoever you choose to obey, you become the slave of that one. And that one will determine what you pursue. I mean, come on, you all have, you have, you have servants. I'm sure you are, some of, not all, some of us have servants, housemates or house helps, whatever we call them. They don't dictate what we do. We dictate for them. Wash, clean, mop, do this and do that, cook, prepare the bed, prepare the children for, for bed and all of that. Same, same, same with this matter of life. Amen. And God has given us his word to know that we may not walk in darkness or in ignorance. So, Philippians 121, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because if I take exit from this body, I go to heaven in Jesus' name. But for to me to be alive in this time, this not me, this Christ. In Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no, long, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. How many people who are pursuing all that is of God can say this? How many of them? Oh, they can say to impress us in church. Or they can say to, to, to stand and sit there. No, no, no. But deep down, the Lord knows those who are his. Whose life is, is Christ-centered or Christ-centric. Amen. I, I believe for the believer, we must on a daily basis have a discovery of, of this life in Christ Jesus. And that's why the Bible is given to us for us to study and to know. Amen. The life you live is not yours. It's Christ. As a matter of fact, your time on earth is a lease from God. Amen. It's a lease from God. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I have been crucified. I have been executed. I have died with Christ. It is no, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Oh, and I pray that is your, your, your confession and your faith in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, if that is the case, then it is Christ who is the master that you are serving. He will not only 
ensure that you, you follow the right pursuit and to find the kingdom for everything else that those who are not against are pursuing the money, the fame, the popularity, the clothes and the house and everything else will be added unto you. It is not for you to pursue. It is it's to be added. And there's a difference. And those who are serving mammon are pursuing with their skills and talents and abilities and their resources. But God is saying, I will add those pursuits to you. I will add the object or the targets of that pursuit to you. You don't need to stress or to or to or to or to scheme or, or to or, or no no no. I will do the work for you. You just sit down and enjoy the benefits, which is a, I think is a better deal, George. I believe that's a much much better deal. So as I as I prepare to close this segment, we move into next Sunday to conclude. Amen. God is looking to you. Amen. He knows everything. Please remember the prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. If you don't do the, your will, his will, the party is located for you as your life, as your destiny. Who is going to do it? My prayer is that none of us will slow down the move of God, slow down the purpose of God, that we, that we, we are ready vessels in, his, in the master's hand for him to do his will. Amen. Church, let me <laughs> share that, that by consistently making Christ the center and focus of our daily living, amen, we, we, are, we are in the right pursuit. By consistently making Christ the center and the focus of our daily living, what will Christ have me do? What will Christ have me do? Will what I'm doing now glorify God? And this new relationship. Amen. I'm, I'm, as, I'm aspiring to get a new job, a new promotion, to change careers. Lord, what are you saying? How will this new career move glorify your name? How, how will this bring people to know you? How would your light shine through me in this, in this new office I'm going to? Or of course, there will be oppositions. There will be people who have all kinds of contradictions that they, they will put against you. But, but the truth of the matter is, you are there as the beacon of light, the beacon of God's hope to that immediate community. Whether it's in your new neighborhood, where you put a new house, or whether it's, it's in a new office where you're working, or whatever, whatever it may be. Jesus is not going to come a second time to do what he says to do. The angels will not do it. This has been commissioned to us to live as Christ in this world, to be the image that, 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 that we lost in Adam. Now that image we start to us in Christ. So that it does in that we see the image of Christ in us. To make the right pursuit, people of God, is that we consistently live for him. That we consistently make Christ the center and the focus of our daily living. Which means there is no day we don't have an engagement or interaction with him. There is no day we don't spend time with him, to be honest. There is no day if we don't have some communion, there's no day, there's no communication with heaven. Not only when things are beginning to go by, you all begin to cry, Father, save me. No, 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 no. That from, from when you wake up to when you go back to bed, is all, the opening and the closing is Christ and everything in between. The opening of your day and the closing of your day is Christ and everything is in between. Oh, you may not preach to a thousand people, you may not do a crusade, but in everything that you do, Christ is in. And he is glorified. Remember Matthew chapter 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. In fact, let me, I just recited it, but let me, let me read it from my New King James. Amen. Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 16. The Bible says to us, Amen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light. It's not God's responsibility, Father, shine my light. Uh -huh. It is you. I pray that the light in you should not, will not be in darkness in Jesus' name. I pray that the candle of you, our spirit, being the candle of the Lord, shall continue to, you know, you know, to shine brighter and brighter on the perfect day. Let your light so shine before me that they may see your good works. Amen. And that goes back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. God has prepared good works. In fact, let me, let me just quickly read for us 
Ephesians um, 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 2 10. Amen. I know I've recited a number of times already, but it's it's pre it's it is particularly relevant to the conversation this morning. Uh, sorry, this afternoon. Amen. For where is workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works? You and I were not created for bad works, for good works. Every purpose of God is good. I'm telling you, every plan of God is good. Every nation of God is good. It is the enemy that tries to trick us, to make us feel and believe and think that God is not. Listen, God is God is full of life. There's no shadow of relation of turning in Almighty God. There's no altar of darkness. God, everything that God does, everything that God is, is He told Moses, "Wait, you will see my goodness pass before you." Amen. Goodness is part of God's nature. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. One of them. The dimensions of it is goodness. Amen. And so we are created for good works. And I pray in Jesus that you will find the work that God has created for you. And you begin to pursue that work of God with all of your heart and all of your strength and all of your energy and talents and ability and resources and for fulfill it in Jesus' name. You are not created for bad works. You and I are created for good works. Let your light so shine before men. That they may see your good works. Please know the two scriptures. Matthew 5 verse 16 and Ephesians 2 verse 10. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works or for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is not now, people of God. The agenda, the destiny, the purpose, the plan has been set. We are in time living out the drama of life that God already concluded. Nothing takes God, God by surprise. Amen. Everything I'm saying today, people of God, I pray we make faith and hope to rise up in us. Our God is dependable. We can trust him and not live like Gentiles, pursuing what Gentiles do, but rather having faith in God that he who has promised, who will never fail, shall come true for us in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. And so Matthew 5, 16 concludes by saying, let your life so shine before men. It's not before God. He doesn't need you to shine before him. He knows you. He sent you on the journey that those who are in darkness will see you and see your light. Amen. See your good works. <laughs> and then praise him and give him glory. And by so doing, they come to faith in Christ Jesus. Your work, even you as a full-time housewife, raising the children, maybe a single parent, struggling between work and, and all these things, Everything that we do, let it be that the confession of your testimony or the confession of, 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 of that comes from your heart is that God is making it possible so that those who hear and see what God is doing for you will be drawn and attracted to God, to Christ and the kingdom in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. That is what it is to live consistently day and night for Christ. Live in the Christ in the night. Whether you are in the, in the in the executive board making decisions affecting thousands of workers across the globe, it doesn't matter. Let all of that Bring glory to God. Let them see Christ at work in that sphere of influence where he's placed. Church, as I close it, people of God, we continue next week on part number three. God wants us to expand our lives because people of God, whether you like it or not, you are one day shorter. <laughs> oh, to myself, I'm 90 years. Amen. But it's really matter is you are one day, at a, at a, one day, one week, one month. Amen. By tomorrow, you'll be one day shorter of the 90 years. We don't have time. We don't have life to waste. Amen. Life is denominated on the number of years. Oh, she lived 60 years, 80 years, 90 years. I pray we live up to 120, the Bible says, talk about. But the truth of the matter is, every day that passes, every week that passes, every month, every year that passes, we are one day, one week, one month, one year shorter of the death, of, of the number of years that God has given to us on this earth. So you and I have no time to waste. We have no life to waste. We are running out of life, not even time. Amen. So whatever is left, let it be the right pursuit. Christ-centered, the master of righteousness that guarantees us holiness and eternity with him. Church, I bless God for your lives. And I pray for these two parts that we preached. Part one last night, part two today, you've heard him. And may you refocus your pursuits so that you'll be in line with serving the King of God. God bless you. Until next Sunday, keep the faith. Remember, Jesus loves you. He will come to for you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.